Good evening once again. This is the Committee of the Whole. Uh, I am standing in for Sharice, who is uh, coming here remotely. Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Here. Mr. Evans? Here. Ms. Hersey? Here. Ms. Colasetti? Here. Ms. Bishop? Ms. Wilkin? Here. Mr. Quisenberry? Here. Mayor Marlin? Here. The next item is approval of the previous, sorry, approval of minutes of the previous meetings. There aren't any right now. Are there any additions to the agenda? Uh, presentations and public input. Uh, just a reminder, this is the Committee of the Whole. If you would like to address the committee, please step up to the microphone and state your name for the record. Good evening. I'm Eric Sachs. <clears throat> uh, the proposed ordinance, number 2024-11-34, an ordinance to amend the Urbana Zoning Ordinance uh, with additional lot area and with requirements for certain uses, is not merely a clarification of the current code, but rather it is a large and substantive change to zoning that will negatively impact our city. The current zoning ordinance requires duplexes to be on larger and wider lots than single family homes. But the proposed ordinance would eliminate lot area and width requirements for building on all existing lots. City, city staff's stated goal of the proposed ordinance is to allow duplexes to be built on all R2 and R3 lots, regardless of the lot size. This is a huge change from, the long from longstanding precedent. For more than 50 years, our zoning ordinances have specifically prohibited the building of duplexes on small lots. In 1970, Urbana's third zoning ordinance established lot area and width requirements for new, duple new duplex lots as 9,000 square feet slash 80 feet. In 1990, the amendment, our current regulation, requires 6,000 square feet slash 60 feet. These specific lot minimum requirements for duplexes were intentional. It was understood that housing too many people on too small of a lot would be disadvantageous to the residents of the duplexes and to the broader community. I would also point out that there's no barrier to a prospective uh, builder of a duplex to combining lots, either in part or whole, to meet the minimum requirements. And this is very common in the older parts of West Urbana for not just duplexes, but for houses in general. Last week, you heard many residents of Urbana tell you that the proposed ordinance is bad and that they do not want this change. I and many others believe that the proposed ordinance would greatly reduce affordability of housing, especially home ownership in Urbana. Moreover, this comes at a time when affordability of housing is a serious issue locally. Given that the large number of lots that would be affected by the proposed ordinance, 38% in R3 and 51% in R2, the changes would, it would bring can be expected to be large. Thus, the proposed ordinance would allow and encourage R2 and R3 neighborhoods to be radically altered and not for the better. Moreover, Urbana's older neighborhoods with the smaller lots and houses would be disproportionately affected. Notably, the proposed ordinance is inconsistent with goal one of the comprehensive plan, preserve and enhance the character of Urbana's established residential neighborhoods. Yet, no cost-benefit analysis has been, has been presented, and indeed staff described no compelling benefits to the city or its residents. During the previous meeting on November 12th, C council asked city staff for more data on how other remaining zoning requirements, such as floor area ratio, setbacks, and parking, might limit the proportion of existing R2 and R3 lots on which duplexes could be built under the proposed ordinance. While such data will be interesting to consider, it may be a moot point. Given that city staff clearly stated that their new goal is to add, allow duplexes on all existing R2 and R3 lots, it is only logical that in the future we can expect new requests to change requirements for floor area ratio setbacks and or parking until this goal is fully achieved. As a matter of process, council would be ill-advised to make a major changes to zoning in a piecemeal fashion and without a clear consensus as to what are the goals and what are the benefits and, that, and without carefully considering what is the cost to benefit ratio? Thank you.
Would anybody else like to address the Committee of the Whole? I have um, a letter to read. Oh, one second, Cherise. Please. Okay. My name is David Huber. I'm a resident of Urbana. Um, I'm the applicant for this case, <clears throat> as I mentioned last week. Um, let me just run through uh, so, some of what happened at the plan commission um, and what I discussed there um, as this transpired. Um, you know, I made sure to mention that actually, um, you know, there was a surprise. Oh, he submitted this application. Well, as I said, that's a right I have. Um, what's the alternative? Some shady back door deal in a smoky room between a developer. Everything's been very transparent. I did the application. I submitted it to the plan commission. It's been reviewed publicly and so on. Um, the economics of development, um, there's just simply no way to justify demolishing a house that has, that is livable um, to only build an additional unit. So in fact, um, a lot of why develop uh, duplexes and other forms of missing middle housing are promoted is that you can do it more incrementally. Oftentimes you can take an existing house, add an additional unit to it um, without really altering that house um, that much. Um, this gives a lot of flexibility to people as far as how they can choose to live, um, to have a live-in caretaker if they wanted to build this thing. In, in any case, someone on Facebook um, said, hmm, this proposal, hmm, but maybe if we make it benefit small-scale developers. Well, inherently it benefits small-scale developers. Um, developers from Atlanta aren't flying in to develop duplexes in the city of Urbana. Um, and these, this is the scale of housing that um, builders can, can develop, architects can develop, homeowners who choose to add an additional unit to their house can be the developer. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the development economics simply of demolishing houses is a fallacy. Um, they're in cases, however, where um, very poor houses exist and that cannot actually be lived in, cannot actually meet the requirements of the city of Urbana's, say, rental ordinance and rental registration program, um, you then have the problem of acquiring this property, demolishing it, and then how do you make it um, in, justified economically. Um, we have golf courses where you can get a tax abatement, Stone Creek, Behringer Commons. In a lot of our neighborhoods central to downtown, older neighborhoods, we don't have that tax abatement incentive. We don't have the sales tax abatement on building materials. So how do you, um, say, buy a really bad house for 30,000, pay 10, 15,000, maybe 20, demolish it if there's a basement? Um, you don't know if that sewer is gonna have to be fixed um, all the way back to the street and so on. So all of a sudden to get to a bare lot, you might be at 40, 50, $60,000. You can look up what it costs to buy a lot at Stone Creek. Under our current ordinance, you can build no more than at Stone Creek on a lot of these lots. So you're not able to actually redevelop them um, because you don't have that additional unit um, and so, yes, um, it's widely understood that uh, spreading the cost of land over multiple units is the easiest way to create or lower the cost of housing. Um, add in that you can reduce the amount, amount of walls or exterior surface area, you can lower the cost of housing. I can tell you from houses I own, the rent is cheaper in a duplex than in a house that is not a duplex. Is that a bad thing? No, I think it's good for the person who makes it and it's good for the occupant. Um, the idea that everyone needs to live to some standard or uh, that is established by one neighborhood in our city is 
disturbing. Uh, and, you know, this was voted on five to zero by plan commission. Three of those five people live in that neighborhood of Wuna. Um, it's indefensible. There was reservations on the plan commission, but they can't defend it. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Anybody else like to address the committee as a whole? I'm Carmen Bluboth. Um, I bought one of these tiny houses on a really small lot last year, and I was so proud to finally achieve home ownership. Um, that was a privilege that I strove for and saved for for a really long time. My budget was really, really limited. Um, and I just sort of, I feel like, um, like this resolution uh, could could, oper could operate at a trade-off with these tiny little houses. These are the ones that are gonna be at risk for developers snapping them up and turning them into uh, duplex properties. And so I agree that like affordable housing is something that we should prioritize and, and, and find really creative ways to, um, to achieve more rental units to, to make housing here more affordable. But I also want other people with limited incomes to be able to achieve home ownership as well. And it's been a challenge. It was a, like a, almost a year of, of striving and not being able to land an offer that was accepted in my price range. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm back. I'm sorry. I didn't realize we had a committee of the whole tonight. I'm so sorry. So I would like to speak again on this issue. Um, my name is Adani Sanchez. I'm in Champaign, but I really want to encourage more people to come to this community, both Champaign and Urbana, and that means opening up our neighborhoods so that there are a variety of options that people have um, in every neighborhood. Every, I want duplexes next door to me. I want apartments next door to me because when we have new families who are just starting out, they're not interested in staying in an apartment anymore, but they're willing to kind of go the next step, um, but they can't quite afford uh, housing costs in Wuna, so it's going to be really difficult. It took me two years uh, to find a place that I could possibly afford, and that was not, uh, that was through very much a lucky chance. Um, it is not usual. It's been very difficult to find housing here, especially housing that's affordable. So when we're talking about what we want the future of this community to look like, it's incredibly important to have options that are available to everyone and not to roll up the ladder behind us and close the gates. Um, so that part of that means having a variety of housing for people who uh, might not be able to afford a whole uh, a whole single family home. Anytime we're talking about neighborhoods where there's only single family homes, that means you only want people who can afford a single family home to live there. And so when you're saying you don't want other types of housing, you're saying, I don't want people who can pay less rent than I can. Um, so I just want that to take into consideration. These are homes. These aren't eyesores. These are homes for people to live that's going to make their life more stable. Um, so when we talk about affordable housing, we talk about it at all levels. And hopefully, uh, you'll take that into consideration for the future of our community. Thank you. All right, if there's nobody else who would like to address the committee the whole, I believe, Sharice, you wanted to read a letter? Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, this letter is from Melinda Carr. Dear Mayor Marlin and members of the Urbana Account Committee of the Whole, I, Assistant Pastor Melinda Carr, Interim President of North End United, am writing on behalf of the North End United group, including residents of Carver Park Subdivision and other surrounding neighborhoods, which are historically African American. At tonight's meeting on November 18, 2024, the City of Urbana will be approving resolutions to accept two grants for Hope Village, Inc., a tiny homes project for medically fragile individuals from the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, DCEO, in the amounts of $1.2 million and $250,000. Housing for the homeless is a good cause. What we oppose is that you did this without fully addressing concerns of neighboring residents, including a pending City of Urbana Human Relations Commission complaint and an unresolved complaint with the Illinois Attorney General's Office. The neighboring residents of Carver Park Subdivision and other surrounding neighborhoods 
also tried filing a complaint with the Illinois Department of Human Rights and has filed a complaint with the City of Champaign Human Relations Commission. Following is a summary of the issues the group has raised with governing bodies in both cities in opposition to the location and future programming of Hope Village. The group alleges the cities have failed in their most important role by relinquishing or giving up their fiduciary responsibilities to other entities instead of doing what is in the best interest of the residents. Lack of community involvement in the planning process and rejecting an alternative design plan to alleviate neighboring residents' concerns was as outlined in the uh, existing ordinance, Ordinance 2023-07-023 PDF, uh, page 4, section 1, number 2, the plan is responsive to the concerns of neighboring, neighboring residents. Prohibit intrusion to the existing infrastructure and allow access through the previously identified address due to increased traffic and noise pollution, public safety risks, surrounding the location of a retention pond and other economic impacts. The Urbana Plan Commission publicly acknowledged the inadequate planning process. The Illinois Attorney General's Office is still reviewing a closed meeting held on December 7, 2023, as to whether it took place in violation of the Open Meetings Act. See the video starting at 3944 Mark Plan Commission meeting an article, Plan Commission Holds Questionable Closed Meeting, Urbana, Illinois, Check CU. In light of these issues, we are asking the City of Urbana, Committee of the Whole, to postpone the discussion to approve the resolutions until the next City Council meeting out of respect for the regular process and include future allowances that will address the concerns of the neighboring residents in an equitable manner. Best regards, Assistant Pastor Melinda Carr. All right, thank you. I have two additional items to read into the record. This one is for Miriam Keep. I'm writing in support of the proposed zoning amendment to allow duplexes on smaller lots. I'm in favor of this measure that will increase the number of homes available, increase the diversity of housing options in the transient friendly areas, and encourage infill development. I moved to Urbana about a year and a half ago to start a job at the university. My experience has been enrich enriched by finding affordable rental housing in a neighborhood where I can easily walk and bike to the university and downtown amenities, which has enabled me to build a community here and to get involved in community events and volunteer programs. The housing options were limited, but I got lucky, and I know many others who have struggled to find convenient housing. For me, living in a transient-friendly, well-connected neighborhood has made Urbana a great place to live, and I want this experience to be available to others. The proposal before the council is ultimately a very moderate, moderate measure to encourage more housing development. The demand for housing is clear, and I urge the council to support this measure that is also aligned with the city's own goal to promote growth within the city's borders. The next one is, let's see here, Susan Appel. Hopefully I said the last name right. Um, from the Advocacy Committee of the Preservation and Conservation Association of Champaign County, PACA, concerning Ordinance Number 2024-11034, an ordinance amending the Urbana Zoning Ordinance, updated Section 6.3 for clarity and to remove additional lot area and width requirements for certain uses, Plan Case Number 2493-T24. At first blush, the notion of fixing up a few dilapidated properties in the East Washington area East Washington Street area seems welcome, an aid to the city's tax base and the neighborhood, as a developer has worked in this area for some time. A quick leap of faith was made, however, from Washington Street to the entire city, where R2 and R3 zoning exist, to cast an eye on any lot in any neighborhood which is smaller than 60 feet wide. From Savannah Green to Landis Farms and Doreen Miller Drive, any lot which has seemed protected from the increased density of a duplex, eight unrelated dwellers, could be subject to developer scrutiny. Many narrow lots were platted as a response to the very real post-World War II housing shortage. More recently, smaller lots have expressed their desire for more affordable home ownership, a toehold on the path to equity stakes. 
A commercial loan is a different animal from a traditional home loan. If you have one commercial loan, it is easier to get another and so on. A developer can move many could move more nimbly than a family seeking a first home loan through a bank. Many families are frustrated by the disappearance of opportunities as the fixer uppers are snatched away by those with a large line of credit. City staff contends that they present this language to the council at the unanimous behest of the plan commission. But in the past few weeks, staff has asserted that you should ignore unanimous decisions of the plan commission when they do not suit the staff's desires. Without local reporting to newspapers, newscasts, social media outlets, and neighborhood listservs, it's difficult for the citizens to, be, to keep tabs on the decisions of those elected and appointed to office. Discussion of the proposal should have begun at the plan commission meetings. Without the activism of one WUNA list member, this case might have sailed through the council unnoticed outside of these walls. PACA asks you again to postpone a decision this evening to allow time for public and official discussion. A common concern voiced to PACA and at last, meeting, last week's meeting of the Council Committee of the Whole has been a lack of illustrations, specifically examples of duplexes and shared lot line dwellings on small lots. While such illustrations are expected at the current meeting, neither the public nor the council members have had advance exposure to those to contemplate them before a decision is made. But there is no need to rush. Time is, in fact, plentiful to consider what could make a strong impact on the character of the city of Urbana. Doesn't the city deserve that? For, the, for that reason, we seek time for public and council education and input before any final decision is made. Please table this proposal tonight and come back to it when more complete evidence has been made available. All right, and with that, we're going to end our public input segment. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a staff report for use cycle options. Is Tim here? Tim and Scott. Good evening, Council. Back to discuss use cycle again with you. Um, we've taken some time to kind of churn through a little bit more logistics and specifics on different types of <clears throat> rate adjustments that may warrant consideration um, and get some more feedback from you guys on this um, going forward. Um, one thing, one reason we're talking tonight is because one of our items is included on the, the budget amendment within uh, the business items this evening. Uh, the tax rate adjustments will be discussed at a subsequent meeting um, from here with either some options or some input from you folks tonight on that. Thank you for that intro introduction. So, uh, you know, the, the two critical questions uh, before us tonight that we want to share some information on and get some feedback from Council on are first, what is the level of service we want to pursue? Um, and, and this in, uh, impacts um, the contracts we're going to sign and also uh, the, the fees we're going to establish for residents. So the, the options are weekly, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in every other week. The second question for us to consider tonight is uh, how we want to adjust rates to pay for the current costs of providing this service. And we're going to detail, and Tim specifically is going to detail um, three different options. One is, uh, you know, the bite the bullet option. We'll, we'll adjust the fee to pay for the entire, you know, current cost in one fell swoop. The second is spreading the increase across three years and using fund balance. And in both of these instances, in the future, we will just incrementally, uh, or, or we're recommending just an incremental. Um, increase in the in the fees that residents pay according to inflation and then the third option would also be a, a, a slow step up in the fee um, but that would be smaller steps by rolling out uh, a carry out bag fee subsidy so that's something in, in mayor and council uh, uh, goals so so some considerations on the service level for curbside recycling you cycle um, this uh, curbside has been weekly since the 1990s, really since this, the modern iteration of the program. 
cost of the service is really still quite affordable. It's, it's comparable to other communities. It's much cheaper than what a household's gonna pay for garbage service. Um, the volume of recyclables has increased significantly since the 1990s. Um, first there was, you know, Amazon boxes, cardboard boxes, and then there was the plastic containers for food service delivery. And so things have, have changed over the years and there's, there's just more volume. Um, some of the impacts of reducing uh, service from weekly to every other week um, are, well, one, we would spend less per year, but the marginal cost of each collection would actually be higher. So that's an interesting trade-off to think about. Um, we, we are confident that, um, you know, the, the second item here, we're confident that there are some number of households, impossible to, to speculate on how many, um, which are going to find that one 60-gallon uh, cart uh, collected every other week is not sufficient for all the recyclables they generate, and they will probably just put the balance in the garbage. And that leads to the last one here. Um, we're probably going to see some materials um, that people can't hold over two weeks just be placed in the garbage. So I'll jump in here and we've tried to just, you know, you could do this through a number of different iterations. So we tried to pinpoint a few that made sense to us and then kind of compare them across each other. Um, so the top chart is if we maintain weekly curbside service still. And I guess one thing I'll, I'll say is we're really just talking about curbside here. There is an adjustment necessary for the multifamily service, but incrementally it's much it's, it's much more insubstantial than this. Uh, the Doing one immediate step in that is a 20% increase. Uh, steps is less than a 10% increase versus these are, you know, in the vicinity of 100% or more in some cases. So... Uh, I'll just walk through them real quick, and then um, we'll get through it, and then you guys can ask questions. We can go back to this and drill down on this more. But uh, just looking at the first option, you know, doing one major step increase in fiscal year, uh, effective January 1, fiscal year 25, within 2.5% inflation projected uh, thereafter would lead us going from a, th a current rate of $3.25 to $7.65. Uh, beginning January 1, and then incrementing at 2.5% beyond that. Uh, the second option, trying to step this in uh, to, uh, to limit its impacts on our users, um, we tried to kind of do that in a balanced way where we would go to $5.25 in January 125, uh, $7 in fiscal year 26, and then $8.75 in fiscal year 27. Uh, that's a jump of two dollars the first year, dollar seventy-five the second year, dollar seventy-five the third year, and then we'd be able to increment uh, by some inflationary factor thereafter. Um, and then the third option was <coughs> looking at the single-use carryout bag subsidy with uh, smaller steps and then inflation. And as you can see there, if we were, and some of that is projecting what kind of revenue we think that would actually generate. Um, that is an unknown. It could generate a lot. It could generate very little. Um, you know, this is based on an assumption, I think, of $250,000 in revenue um, in year one for that. And what we've seen with those is uh, other people that have done those is it, it kind of has a half-life. So after the first year, you have a bunch of change, so a big drop-off and then a, a big drop-off, big drop-off until a point you get down to something that's going to stabilize and maintain there. But uh, the thoughts being is, you know, if, if we're able to stand that up year one, we're not going to have to have quite as big of an impact on people year two, uh, you know, basically we can draw out those steps longer and subsidize with that because that will not be a sustainable revenue source. We know it's built to go away, but it could be something that could, you know, help soften the blow of this. And then simultaneously at the at a point in time, it stabilizes uh, if we don't feel like we need to subsidize it anymore. And we can do that within just the use cycle rates alone. We could repurpose those funds for some other uh, use or instance. Um, just comparing those numbers to, you know, going from weekly to every other week, uh, you know, the major step, instead of 765 to maintain weekly service, we'd go to $4.90. Um, the three-year steps, instead of 525, 7, and 875, we would go to $4, 475, and $5.50. And then the single-use carryout bag subsidy, 
instead of 475, 625, 750, and 875, we'd be at 375, 425, 475, and 525. And I feel like I just said a lot of numbers, but we'll come back to that and drill down on it more. But we've tried to highlight this so that you could see them side by side for comparison, uh, highlighting the step increases in yellow, and then when the inflationary increases kick in in blue. Uh, we actually went ahead and carried this out through a 10-year projection just to try to ensure it's stable. And uh, with the structures that we've built here, uh, we would project maintaining about a 10% fund balance year over year um, to kind of handle fluctuations uh, through the 10-year projection in that regard. Uh, now, our contract uh, for the current services that uh, we would be looking to award is a five-year contract. So after five years, there's potential that if there's more substantial changes at that time, uh, that we may be revisiting this. But the hope would be that if we can get to something that's sustainable, we can just maintain with inflationary adjustments, such as hopefully the cost of those services as well. So what we're recommending and what we would like some feedback on is one on the first question, maintain weekly service. Um, this is, uh, I think, uh, an expectation of our residents. It's um, certainly what they're used to. Um, as I mentioned before, still reasonably affordable, um, maintains a high level of environmental sustainability in the sense of I think we're going to collect more, we're going to recycle more materials if we have weekly service. On the second question, um, staff is recommending that we pursue uh, a carry-out bag fee, sometimes called a plastic bag fee, as it is here on this slide. Um, and the smaller uh, multiple step up of the fee for residents, and, and then uh, an inflation, you know, an annual um, inflation-related uh, increase in the fee thereafter. Um, so you know, something that makes this particularly relevant is. Um, there's really very, there's not very many uh, processors of recycling materials that accept uh, plastic carryout bags in curbside collection anymore. Um, that can only be done with a, a totally manual hand sort, and uh, that's not really where any of the, the you know, most of the market is these days. So we're not accepting that in, in curbside in the future. Um, you know, by having um, these smaller steps, it's a little more digestible and easy for folks to budget for. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's viable to implement within probably a 20, FY 2026 um, fee schedule. Just to <clears throat> flesh out a little bit what we mean by a carryout bag fee, um, there are, you know, th there's been a, a confluence of terms and conditions on these that you'll see at, in other ordinances in the state, which is to say all the other cities have nearly identical ordinances who have done this. Most of them are at uh, a 10 cent per bag. There is a ton of exceptions. So every exception you might be thinking of, well, what about that? That wouldn't make sense. That's already, you know, others who have been crafting and recrafting these ordinances in Illinois have, have thought of that. And that's, you'll probably see that. Um, if we bring a draft at some point in the future. Uh, most cities are at a, a, a 5,000 square foot threshold. There are, there's one at 3,000, there's one at 10,000. So there's flexibility there. Um, we think that this is probably gonna impact less than 100 businesses in Urbana. Um, it may be such that um, through the data we can collect, we send a letter to 150 businesses and. 75 you know, call us and say, I don't think this applies to me, and it turns out they're right. But we think it'll probably end up affecting less than 100 businesses. Um, most of the cities that are engaging in these ordinances are doing a pretty simple public engagement rollout. They let the affected businesses know, of course. They do some, um, some, some broadcasting of the, of the issue and what, what the impact is for residents and, and carry on. Um, we're estimating, uh, just really for, for putting together some numbers, uh, $250,000 year one revenue. It's pretty hard to tell because this is based on people's behavior at the grocery store, what that you know, year one revenue will really be. Could be 100,000 more than that, could be 100,000 less than that. 
Um, but what we are confident about is year two and thereafter, it's going to be a lot less because people are going to change their behavior. And that's kind of the point of this type of policy is that you incentivize, um, you know, less, less uh, single use um, waste. Um, we we think that you know we can start to work on this in January of 2025, and in fiscal year 2026 have this in the fee schedule. So just kind of putting a pin in what has to happen, and we haven't talked about the budget amendment so much here, but um, we do have available fund balance currently that's not within this fiscal year's budget. What we're asking for in the budget amendment would be to pull funds out of the fund balance so that we have funds available to initiate a contract for to maintain curbside recycling services. Um, if it were to remain weekly, we need $300,000, which is the ask within the budget amendment. If it were to go every other week, we still need $200,000. So that would be the, the, the caveat there. But for the budget amendment, that would tell us we, we would have budget authority to execute a contract to maintain service when our other contract um, ends. Uh, uh, just a reminder on that, the current bids that we have are good through, I think, December 19th, so that's kind of the time sensitivity of getting the budget amendment passed. Um, the second part of this is really evaluating the models for maintaining the service and the rate structure to support it. Um, we've made our recommendation. Obviously, we're willing to take feedback from you folks and, you know, modify from there or, you know, bring back an ordinance in early December to, you know, solidify whatever your guys' opinions are on the rate structures moving forward. And that's all we've got. So if you guys want to go somewhere and chat about something, please feel free to direct me as necessary and we'll try to answer any questions we can. Chris. Okay, so the, uh, the numbers are per month, correct? Okay. Correct. Because um, you didn't say it, and I just wanted the public to yep. know that. Yeah, per month. Um, has there been any measurements made on how businesses feel about a bag tax, those less than 100 businesses? Any idea? Not at this point. Uh, that would be part of it. We would do some community outreach as one of the first initial things. Right now, we're just trying to distill the list down of people that we think would be impacted based on what others are doing. And then once we get that list kind of weaned down to who we think would be affected, plus you know some reasonable estimate beyond that to make sure we're not missing somebody, we would reach out with more information on it, probably have some type of public... Uh, engagement here at a council meeting or something that if they wanted to come have a discussion uh, to have their voices heard they could do so yeah um, and I guess the, the retailer would be responsible for tabulating and cutting us the check how many bags left their store and then the consumer is just being charged that 10 cents per bag that we're carrying to the car is that correct how yeah. that works okay 10 cents a bag generally but we haven't fixed on that we're just Correct. That's that's kind of a standard that we've seen in a lot of places that has led to impactful change. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm just doing some quick numbers here. Um, the weekly curbside, if I use the fiscal year 30, the difference is $39 a year at the existing rate and $103 a year at the rate in fiscal year 30. Is that correct? That seems about right. And yeah. then for the every other week, it goes from 39, which is existing, to 66 the same year. Yes. So you're 30. Okay. Yep. I just want to make sure I had those numbers yep, right. Yep, that looks right. Other questions for staff? Grace. Thank you. Um, not a question, but sounds like they're asking for input. And I agree with the recommended option of pursuing the carry-out bag fee and having those smaller steps to reduce as much as we can to residents, especially so suddenly. Um, also just wanted to remind us that there's been years of work on this, and I'm glad that it's coming now. Um, I think it would have been even better if we had started this um, years ago instead of, like, once we actually need it right now, if we can do things a little further ahead. Um, and that there has been some groundwork. I know that you'll need to do some of your own work too, but I'll be happy to refresh or send along anything else. We've had some 
student classes help us in the past. They've already compiled a list of grocers and their square footage for us in Urbana. Um, there's been drafts of this resolution and some of the details, as you're aware of, from the Sustainability Advisory Commission that have already been recognized in the council goals. Um, so just wanted to remind us all that there's been years of work and planning in this already, and I hope that we can utilize some of that stuff too. Yep. Chandra. <clears throat> I was just going to say that um, I like the idea of sticking with the weekly service. Um, uh, for the very reasons that you um, listed before, making sure that, you know, service is still accurate and the point of recycling is, is maintained. Um, I'm, I do like the smaller steps, sort of like Grace said, like sometimes it's a big sticker shock when, you know, prices jump really quickly for, for households. So, um, and then to, to roll in the, the carry out bag fee with that, um, I think is a good idea as well, so. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo the, I guess, forming consensus um, that I think the recommendation makes a lot of sense for, for all the reasons that you've stated. And I do want to reinforce what Grace said, though, that this is not out of the blue, right? This is something that actually has been brought up in council goal setting and we've had community participation and, and you know, the sustainability Advisory Commission has been talking about this, and um, it's unfortunate that this is what needs to prompt it, but I do think it's important to, to recognize all the work that has gone into positioning us to be able to, I mean, I know it's still gonna be a lot of work for city staff, but um, I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of work has already been done on this that positions us to be able to, to move forward with this. So I think the plan makes sense, and it's, it's in, in line with the stated values of the city. So I'm, I'm gonna have to disagree with my colleagues. I would rather see us go to the every other week curbside. I do agree with the single use carry out. Um, I also rather just go with one big step and then just make it standard so people could plan. Um, it's gonna be roughly $5 or roughly $8 every month. It's a little bit easier. Um, then keep seeing your bills increasing. But that's that's my preference. It sounds like I'm kind of outvoted right now. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there. I think that having going from $39 to $100, $100 is quite a big jump versus $39 and $66. So those are my two cents. Um, Sharice, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I kind of agree with what you just said. Um, I I want to I do want to understand the single carry out uh, better. What he was saying, I'm, I, being on the phone, I don't have you know I, I can see the the pictures and stuff on YouTube, but I'm not quite understanding some things. So if he could the single use carry out bag subsidy, I would like to understand that better. Sure. So the the concept is at the point of purchase. Uh, there is a there's a cost to you know, using those uh, single use bags at the end of the shopping counter, and mm -hmm. the, the cost is pretty nominal, um, but it's just enough that some folks will remember to bring a reusable bag the next time. Um, so you're you're talking about charging um, charging a, a particular fee. Exactly. Uh, per plastic bag. Okay. And and that's because you said something about uh a lot of um recycling places do not recycle single use bags anymore. Correct. Like uh, there there okay. there is that does still happen as a as a drop off recycling, you know, it's particularly in front of certain brands of grocery stores. Um but less yeah. it's it's almost gone completely from a from a curbside collection perspective. Yeah, okay, just, so like, what would what what do you think the cost per single use plastic bag might be added to someone's grocery bill? Yeah, so um, you know that what what most cities in Illinois are doing is ten cents per bag. Okay. Th think about okay, if so, you've been to Aldi; it's a very similar model, but extrapolating that everywhere else. And that f that fee comes back to the city instead of Aldi selling you a bag for its use. 
Yeah, what, what I've what I've had to do several times is just pay twelve cents for a paper bag there. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes, and so you're talking about basically the same thing regarding. And most of the time, of course, I also take bags into Aldi because I'm not going to carry stuff out in the box. But what I'm saying is that, um, so you're saying like at Walmart, at Meijer, at whatever other place, hold, um, because when you go to Sam's, there are no bags. You have to kind of take your own or use a box. At all these, it's basically the same thing unless you buy a reusable bag or a paper bag. Exactly. Um, okay, so... It would be one of those uh, situations where at, at Walmart, Meyer, and in other places that use the single-use bags, they would pay an additional fee per bag. I'm assuming. Correct. Right? Okay, to uh, carry their groceries out. So, are 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 we are what we are we trying to change the psychology of our usual shopper to start bringing their own bags? Exactly. So, uh, you know, the bags have a cost, but we're, you're not charged for them, right? It's just built into the cost of other groceries. And so people, when they appear to be free, people will use more of them. When there is a small cost, um, people will, will change their behavior and, and use less of them. And so the idea is, you know, no one likes the image of, uh, a plastic bag against a chain link fence, um, a plastic right. bag, you know, covering a storm drain. And so if um, some small, um, you know, behavior change strategy, such as, you know, affixing a cost to a thing that does actually have a cost, um, will reduce that, that's a benefit. Okay. I, I understand that now. And what, so the, the um, curbside service, to recycle such bags is going to increase? Is that what you're saying? No. The the, the ability to recycle these plastic single-use bags uh, curbside is going away completely. That won't be accepted in, in you cycle as it's not accepted in essentially every curbside recycling program in the country. Okay, so I have another question because I often use the single-use bags to put crushed bottles in and so on and so forth you no longer want that to happen That's what so <laughs> yes yeah so we won't be accepting um uh those single use grocery bags in the curbside container at all okay so just throw them in the in the recycling bin and be through with it yeah yeah right. it's it's best if all the materials in that commingled or mixed recycling container are loose and what about um okay and this sounds kind of um for lack of a better word stupid um so what if you use garbage what if one uses garb like regular plastic garbage bags you don't want that either correct correct we don't accept any okay. other plastic films in the curbside recycling container. That's a pretty standard um, across recycling programs in the U.S. Okay. I, I just want to understand that and kind of get it out there so people, other people will also understand. No bags. No bags. Period. I think that's okay. part of what lends itself to maybe being a very logical subsidy for this because industry-wide, the ability to do so is also gone so kind of a well that may be a slogan that you use for public um education you know no bags <laughs> because i know ultimately you know i'm 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 i would try to do whatever is more convenient for the recycling people and what i've been doing is is bagging things up as i go um but if if that is going to be the ongoing um, um, uh, policy where you don't want any bags. I think it would it would suit you, you know, well also to kind of do a public education PSA or something like that. No bags in the recycling. Um, Definitely. Of any kind. So I, I just wanted to put that there after, of course, understanding more of what you were saying. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. James, do you have any questions? I, I don't have any specific questions. I will say that I am with the majority on this, which is I would prefer to see weekly pickup continue uh, because I, I think it's going to, if we don't do that, it's going to add to the, the waste stream. And I am uh, supportive of getting this um, bag fee up and running as soon as possible. All right. If nobody and else. I think that, Sharice, did you have I was a, just going to say, it, yeah, isn't that something that we had discussed also before regarding um, cutting down on plastic bags in the city? Um, we had a presentation from, from some U of I students. Yes, I, I um, believe Grace uh, invited some U of I students and has also done some work on the sustainability committee in terms of a bag mm -hmm. fee. Okay, so I, I, so this is something that UCycle will uh, implement with the um, the grocery chains and so on and so forth. Yeah, Public Works and Finance will work together to stand this up. Fiscal year 2026, okay. so about a year and a half. Uh, well, okay, really, okay. we'll start in January 2025 right. and try Sorry. to get it stood up yeah. by fiscal year 26. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, no further questions. I There's nothing except for the budget amendment that we need to go over. Is that correct? No. Okay. Um, I, th I think the budget amendment, you know, Elizabeth will touch on all that stuff, and I'll be available if you have additional questions at that time. Um, the budget amendment, like I said, that you'll see later, it's for... Uh, the three hundred thousand dollars that's in that is pulling from fund balance that would allow us to pay the entirety of the contract once the service switches over in April. Um, otherwise, we don't have adequate fiscal year twenty five budget for that. It is sitting in fund balance and available, but we have to put pull it into the budget to have budget authority to execute a contract. And just to be clear, when you say fund balance, you're talking about the general fund. I'm talking about the U-Cycle fund. U-Cycle fund. U-Cycle okay. fund has somewhere in the vicinity of $450,000 currently. That will draw it down to about 150000 remaining in fund balance, and we would have enough money to pay the bills uh, with a new contract maintained at weekly service. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Hmm. Next up is unfinished business, which is ordinance number 2024-11034, an ordinance amending the Urbana Zoning Ordinance, update section 6-3 for clarity and to remove additional lot area and width requirements for certain uses, plan case number 2493-T24. Kevin. Okay, good evening. All right, so last week at the Committee of the Whole Council uh, had asked us for some additional information. Um, it being a, a pretty short week, we were able to provide some of that in the, the memo that you all received, but I'm gonna go through uh, some, more, some more things tonight. Um, so let me just pull this out. Okay, um, those specific things, uh, just real quick, um, there, was, there was a question about the role that the uh, current comprehensive plan draft Imagine Urbana played um, in evaluating the proposal. Um, there was a request for a chart showing sort of before, let me get this closer to me, uh, before and after um, regulations for duplexes. Um, there's a request for some illustrations for uh, different development scenarios and sort of how those, how the proposed uh, amendment would affect those scenarios. Um, those, I'm not gonna go through, um, those have been provided by the applicant, Mr. Huber, so I'm gonna ask him to come up in a bit to go through those. Um, and then the final request was for a static zoning map and those are provided in your packets. Um, so I'm gonna just go through these bits here. <clears throat> okay, so um, regarding the role of Imagine Urbana um, in, in evaluating this proposal, um, our staff report, uh, neither the staff report or the plan commission um, recommendation used Imagine Urbana, because that's still in, in draft form. Um, so we relied on our current comprehensive plan. Um, if you look back, the plan commission staff report 
I identified several goals and objectives from the 2005, the current comp comprehensive plan um, to support the text amendment. Um, and those are also in your, your committee packet along with several additional objectives that we pulled out as well that supported the amendment. Um, so in relying on the 2005 comprehensive plan, um, so really the policy underpinning for, uh, for this proposed text amendment isn't new. Um, there's ample evidence in the current plan to support the text amendment. Um, that said, uh, as currently drafted, Imagine Urbana would also support uh, the proposed text amendment. I'm not going to go through a bunch of things, but I will point out that big idea number one from Imagine Urbana is that Urbana is a place for everyone. We feel this amendment uh, gets at that. Okay, um, on to the chart. So for current and proposed regulations for duplexes in the R2 and R3 uh, districts, um, this lays out the changes of which uh, only the top three rows here uh, have any of the changes. So uh, currently, if you have a plat, uh, if you have a lot that was platted before 1970, you have to meet this minimum uh, lot size of 6,000 6, square feet and 60 feet wide for a duplex in either district. Um, if it's platted after 1970, it has to be a minimum of 9,000 square feet uh, and 80 feet wide. The proposal is that for um, existing lots, those minimum lot size and width would go away. Um, and then for new lots, um, it would match the, the district's um, standards that are on the books at the time. At this time, it's 6,000 square feet and 60 feet wide. Um, that change is really, it's just aligning um, duplexes in these districts with, uh, with the remaining uh, things that are allowed in the districts. We already, one other thing that this proposed amendment does, which we didn't really get into last time, um, but it, it cleans up a paragraph that essentially says if you have an existing lot, uh, it doesn't have to meet the minimum requirements. It says that, it's pretty convoluted though. Um, so we're just cleaning that up as well as part of this proposed amendment. Um, otherwise, all of the other um, Development regulations in these two districts remain unchanged. Um, and also the zoning approvals that are required um, would be that would continue to be that you would need a conditional use permit in the R2 district and you would have by rights duplexes in the R3 district. Um, so regarding the zoning map, um, like I said, we provided static zoning maps in the packet. Um, but zoning maps really only tell sort of part of the story as uh, indicated by the R2 and R3 maps that I shared last time and that I shared with uh, Plan Commission. Um, tonight I wanted to get a little bit into, um, a little bit more into the realities of duplexes, uh, especially in the R2, or in the R2 district, um, since that seemed to be the hot topic last time. Um, so I will... Uh, get into that, but I want to preface this by saying, um, and and I can't emphasize this enough, is that zoning does not cause development in any way. Um, zoning just provides the the framework in which to allow development to take place. Um, so just making a zoning change is not going to uh, cause changes to happen. It will just allow them to happen if if uh, market conditions allow, you know, make that. Um, a viable thing to do. Uh, in the R2 and in the R3 district, we have had more than 50 years of experience allowing duplexes. Um, again, duplexes in the R2 district require a conditional use permit. I wanted to just look citywide. I know this isn't terribly easy to see right now, um, but citywide we have over 3,500 R2 zone parcels. Um, out of those, we have um, a little over 1,700 that currently allow duplexes with a conditional use permit. Um, so these are all ones that would meet the minimum uh, standards that are in place. Um, out of those, uh, now you can kind of see a little bit better. Um, so these pink parcels are parcels that contain single family homes. So that's over 1,400, that's a little over 80%. And the number of duplexes citywide is 49. Um, so if you're 
thinking in terms of averages, that's we're averaging less than one duplex per year since we've had these, these rules on the books in the R2 district. Um, so. Kevin, can I stop you for a second? Just to make sure I understand these numbers that you're showing here. Sure. So your, your second one, 1743, says currently allows duplex with a conditional use permit. And what I'm hearing you say is that there's 1,743 that meet the minimums that are in our current zoning, Correct. but 49 of them contain duplexes. Correct. Okay, so that means that over 1,700, 1700 people could ask for a duplex and they would be able to do so, meeting the minimum width and the minimum lot. Is that correct? Currently, okay. yes. And that's been essentially the, the case for the past 50 plus years. Um, so just picking a neighborhood at random, um, West, in West Urbana, um, so there are 768 R2 zoned parcels, um, uh, 307 of which currently allow duplexes with a conditional use permit. Um, 266 out of those three, 307 have single family homes on them. Um, and there are 20 duplexes in, in the Western Urbana neighborhood. Um, at least 10 of those were uh, what we would call existing non-conforming uses, so they were uh, created way back in the day before our zoning ordinance, uh, before our zoning rules were, were in place. Um, okay, I'm going to just, okay, I'll, I'll leave that up. Um, Uh, one other point I wanted to make is that um, this this amendment is not really about duplexes as an allowed use, which I think a lot of the comments we've we've heard and um, some of the conversation last time seem to be focused on whether we should allow duplexes as a use. Um, that's established in our zoning ordinance. It it says duplexes should be allowed under certain conditions. Um, so really, this amend or this amendment is about allowing duplexes on lots that are smaller and sometimes very slightly smaller um, than we've required for the last half century. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're focusing on that. Okay, so uh, now that I've sort of gone through uh, the the bits that council asked us to look into last time, I'm going to invite um, the applicant, Mr. Huber, up to um, go through um, the materials that he provided to you all. David, are these the things that you emailed? Are these them? the items that you I emailed? Much. I didn't at that time. Uh, so these are not, we don't currently have access except for these paper copies. Is that correct? It would have been after five. I'm not sure it went in. This is directly from you. you. We received an email from you at 632 about. No, he, he sent. This is. This I think that's different this material. Is something different. This is something different. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify which. But we do have this in electronic format. Okay, great. All right, the floor is yours. Make sure your microphone's on, please. Okay, so uh, I prepared a few sheets. Um, the first one is just a kind of breakdown, not only of, of, of the changes, um, but then what actually the criteria is um, were you to get a conditional use permit or a major variance. Um, <clears throat> and that comes straight from our zoning ordinance. It explains how um, both require a public hearing, but there's difference. Conditional use permit requires a simple majority. Um, a major variance requires two-thirds majority of the ZBA than a city council vote. And the criteria is, is significantly different. Um, 
I would just point out like one of the contradictions. Can you is, hold on for just a moment? I apologize. We do have two people who are remote and do they have access to the documents? Mr. Huber, did you just forward it to my email? Um, no, like at 445. So no, I did not have any emails at either my personal email or city clerk as of 5 p.m. because we were keeping track of public input as well. But what email address did you send it to is what I'm clarifying. Because if it was sent to city council, then the council does no, have to, a copy. to you personally. Okay. So no, the folks remote do not have access to these materials. But they are being displayed currently on the They're screen. Not. They're not being displayed on the screen. That's why I asked. Right. I can. Um, I guess some of it is. Yeah. Let me. I Sorry. I, I did not include this first sheet on here. Um, I can go, while well, Mr. Huber's talking, I can go um, run and, and grab that. Um, we don't even need to talk about it. It's, it's more just okay. put, putting onto one page what is in the zoning ordinance. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the people who are attending remotely had the same yeah. information. But you do have this one on the slide. Yeah. So th this is in response specifically to, um, I think, Grace who kind of wanted to understand, well, how does this actually play out in reality? Um, so rather than a purely speculative case, I took a um, duplex that exists in our city. Um, and for the, this, the purposes of this exercise, it doesn't actually matter where it is um, in the city. Um, it was built in 1928. Um, you could not build this duplex today um, for one reason, which is that the lot width is too narrow. Um, it's This particular lot is 56 feet wide, so that's four feet under the minimum width um, of 60 feet because this lot was platted prior to that date. Um, otherwise, it meets all other requirements of the zoning ordinance, meaning the setbacks, the parking um, that's um, on site, um, the height, and so on. So I used that, and using the assessor's office, I found the, um, um, from the property card, I took the, the floor plan information. And so that's how I derived on these three site plans the footprint of the house. Um, on the left, I drew it. Well, that center drawing is as the house is today. Um, with the setbacks, a driveway to the back, a garage, and so on. Um, that wouldn't be allowed to be built today. So on the left is what, you know, if you wanted to build the same duplex, you'd have to go and find a 60-foot lot at least um, if it were platted before that date. And that is how it would be um, set up. <clears throat> so then I took the, ex I'd made, with the exercise of this, I said, you know, with that same house um, meeting all other requirements, let's assume there was no lot width um, minimum. What is the narrowest lot you would need to build this exact same duplex and meet every single other requirement of the zoning ordinance? Um, and that is 45 feet, assuming it's the same length as that existing lot, which is 137 and nine inches. <clears throat> and so that is based on the 30 and a half feet width of that house, which comes from the assessor, um, a five foot setback um, on one side, and then the minimum width of a driveway is nine feet, according to the zoning ordinance, and the minimum distance between a driveway and a property line is um, one and a half feet. <clears throat> so, this is, you know, this is showing the extreme. Uh, and, and so adding all those things up, it's 45 feet, meaning it's, if this proposed amendment were to pass, um, you could have a 45 foot lot and build that duplex and meet every requirement of the zoning ordinance um, without special relief um, from any of the other requirements. Um, and then as another exercise, which are the two sheets that are side by side, um, I took plans from um, actually South Bend, Indiana. Um, like some other cities, they commissioned 
drawings to be made of houses that um, are pre-approved, meaning you could go in and within a couple of days get approval to build these houses. And that was a way of incentivizing um, people to do infill, smaller housing, and so on. So I took the, uh, a single family house and a two family house as part of this, um, these pre-approved city um, plans. And I, I chose a single family that's the closest in size to this two family dwelling. So the single family on the left is 1,900 square feet. The two family is 1,700 square feet. Um, the single family is 24 feet and so on. Um, and, uh, and then I basically ran it through, um, you know, where could you actually build this? You could build the single family on any lot as long as it's 39 and a half feet. Um, because again, it's 24 feet wide, you need five feet on one side and 10 and a half feet on the other. Um, and you'd need a lot area of 4,750 square feet, um, which would meet, basically that's meeting that floor area ratio requirement, um, which would be unchanged in the R2 and R3 district. So meaning if you wanted to build that house, you'd have to find a lot at least that big. Um, and then if you go over to the right side, the two family dwelling, however, um, even though it's actually smaller, it's 1,760 square feet, it's more narrow, it's 22 feet wide. Um, but it interestingly has the same number of bedrooms in total, four bedrooms. Um, you, if you wanted to build that duplex, um, you would have to find a lot that's 60 feet wide minimum. Um, if it were platted before 1970, you'd need at least 6,000 square feet. If it was a lot after 1970, you'd need an 80-foot lot, 9,000 square feet. Um, and then the last thing on the bottom right is if this ordinance was, um, if this amendment occurred, um, and you no longer had to meet those requirements to build this duplex and to satisfy every other requirement of the zoning ordinance, um, parking, setbacks, so on, you'd need a lot that's at least 75 and a, it's 37 and a half feet um, wide and 4,400 square feet. So the point really is the gulf between um, what we are currently saying is the minimum size of a lot and lot width that is needed for a duplex um, and a prototypical duplex. Um, yes, it's prototypical. It's not um, any indication, but it but it is an indication that such thing is is can be built, is habitable, uh, most likely rentable, and so on. So that gulf between 60 feet and 37 and a half feet, or 80 feet. Um, you know, you you would need an 80 foot lot after 1970 to build this 22 foot wide house. Um, is what the current zoning ordinance is saying. Um, and I guess just the last bit of commentary um, editorializing is that, in fact, one could say it's really great to build duplexes on smaller lots because the effect will be units that are smaller in size. And those smaller size units um, add to housing mix that single family houses generally cannot provide, meaning studios or one bedroom apartments. Um, so uh, there's that housing diversity element. This, in this situation, it's two two bedroom units. And then, um, yeah, there's some other information that's just photos of duplexes in West and East Urbana. Um, they don't need explanation. Um, they're just sort of, here's the stock that we have it's not comprehensive. Um, I, the, again, the only little editorial I'd like to say is that um, in, I, on the left column, I show the house. And then on the right, I show the house next door to it with the house. Um, and in every case, the house next door is a single family. Um, so you'll see that it is not necessarily the case that the duplex is bigger than the single family next door. Um, Sometimes they're smaller, sometimes they're bigger, but in most cases they are not jarringly um, different. So yeah, that is to say that a duplex alone does not produce a larger building um, overall. Questions for the applicant? Chris? So Mary Alice, I'm, I'm gonna say that 
this seems like materials that could have been pr provided in advance, such that myself and Sharice could look at it and actually yeah. understand what's being described here. At this point, it's not persuasive to me because I can't see it. So if we're going to vote on this, I, I'm going to vote no at this point because I haven't, I haven't seen any additional information that, that um, persuades me to vote otherwise. Um, if I can add to that, I, um, because this isn't time sensitive, uh, the other thing that I want to understand, because when you're talking about R2 and R3, I look at, um, at, I looked at the zoning map that was provided, and it seems as if, um, a lot of 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 uh actually practically all of the houses in ward three are 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 two and are three as well and I'm assuming that you know uh, I know that this this particular um, zoning issue would would uh, affect every everyone not just uh everyone in in one particular neighborhood. So what I want to understand regarding um, the history of some of this zoning, my um, and I, I want to. Isn't it true that a lot of times property taxes at the time, because all of the houses in my subdivision, for example, were built before 1970. So what I want to understand too is. Um, weren't some of these um, uh, dwellings built uh, in a particular way according to how property taxes were fixed at the time? Kevin, are you able to answer that? I am not. Okay. Perhaps that's a question for our assessor. They might have some insight into that. Okay, because I, I need to understand... I, I, I mean, what you're basically talking about is changing, changing that up uh, for um, for um, I guess the abilities for people that may own multiple homes in a particular area, and they may be able to. Um, change the atmosphere as well as the entire um, um, setting of how how a particular area has been built so uh, it it kind of um, um, and there's no guarantee that these will be sold properties they w uh, d uh, for single families there they will be but they possibly would be rental units, and we have a very high rate of rental rentals in the city of Urbana as opposed to home ownership. And I definitely prefer home ownership. <laughs> it, it, I just don't, um, so I don't really understand um, how, how the, it would be a benefit on some level, especially since, you, a person has another avenue to already use to if they prefer to build something else differently. All right, uh, Chris, you had a question. Um, so, uh, thank you for the presentations. Um, what is the price point? How much per month for the du for renting in the duplex? Um, I'm not sure. That's not really a consideration that that we take into consideration when we're making zoning changes. Jaya? Yeah. Is this only questions or discussion to clarify? This is questions. Okay. I'll hold off. There is no motion on the table right now. So we're at the moment we're with questions with the applicant and staff. So if there are no further questions. Um, I would entertain next steps. Jaya? 
I'd like to make a motion to keep this in um, committee because I think there's still a lot of questions that I'm hearing. So I'd like to move to keep um, ordinance number 2024-11-034 and ordinance amending the Urbana zoning ordinance update section 6-3 for clarity and to remove additional lot area with, with requirements for certain use plan case number 2493T-24. Second. Moved by Jay and seconded by Grace. So this motion is to keep this in committee. Any discussion? Jaya. Yeah, thank you. I think I think making sure that folks who are not here can see this material is important. And I think there it seems like there's still a lot of questions. I want to make sure that community members can have answered. Um, I will say personally, I think it's really important that we clarify what is and it isn't allowable and that we're consistent, right? I think our zoning ordinance suggests this should be allowable. I think that there's a clear recommendation from the plan commit commission and from city staff who do have expertise in this area. I think the applicant used an allowable legal pathway, um, but I do think it's also important that we, we give time for people to understand why this is coming, what this means, all of that. I do also think it's important to recognize not everybody in our community can afford to buy a home. I, I hear people saying, well, you know, we want these small homes people to be able to buy. That was the case for myself. I, I understand that. But I think about my neighbors where I live, it's definitely a mix of, of rentals as well as ho homes that are owned. Um, and a lot of people are looking for that kind of middle income, something that they can rent where they don't have to get pushed out of Urbana, right? I think that it's important for us to think about how do we have a mix um, so it's not either you have enough money to own something or you're paying an arm and a leg for some tiny little place or you have to move out of Urbana. So um, I do think that making sure we have more opportunities for duplex is important. Um, we've talked a lot about the fact that the city is really struggling with our infrastructure needs because people are moving out now and out. Um, that's not sustainable. We can't just keep going out. We need to be able to look at infill. And it is, in terms of an equity issue, it's important too, right? There's a lot of research that supports that we're zoning people out, right? And I think it's important for us to think about how do we make sure that Urbana is for everyone? Um, so I am very interested in looking at how do we make it um, so that we're actually allowing the things that are supposed to be able to be built in R2 and R3 to be able to be built, including duplexes. But I also am hearing that there's still a lot of questions from folks, so I'd like to keep it in the committee until those questions have an opportunity to be answered. Any other discussion, Grace? Um, I'll just echo that. I appreciate keeping it in committee the whole for some more time for council members um, to review stuff who aren't here and for all of us, just since this is the first time we're seeing it, I think it's some more review time. Um, and then also for the public, if there are any remaining questions, I hope that things are becoming more clear throughout this process. Um, I appreciate the information and want to thank um, Kevin and David here for some of our information. I think that that's really helpful, seeing some of the renderings and some hypotheticals and some of the actual buildings. So I'm hoping that this is becoming more clear for council members and the public about what we're talking about. Um, always still in support of more information and so for that sake, I'm happy to have some more time on this. Um, and overall, I am in support. Uh, I think that this is making sense so far and I appreciate that other information. I think duplexes, I agree with JR, are a good option for housing diversity. Um, I think they're good for our community socially and environmentally. Um, my neighborhood in southeast Urbana has a number of duplexes and um, I think that they enrich our community and don't have any harm. I think it's a great option as our society is also moving towards smaller type of families. There's been a lot of input, people bringing that up. Um, in my neighborhood, it's a lot of seniors, uh, single seniors on a fixed income or single young professionals and a duplex is a great option. So I think that um, this is making sense and I'm also happy to have a little bit more time and information. Chris, would you take the chair for me? I will take the chair and recognize Marie Alice. Um, so first I want to say thank you for um, sharing these renderings. Um, I will say that it actually confirms my um, stance that I don't think this is a good idea and this is why. Um, number one, I, I, there's two things that I was thinking about in terms of affordability. 
Um, the first one is anytime there's new construction, it's not affordable. It's not affordable housing, right? If there's brand new construction, it's going to be top dollar housing. Um, but then the second thing actually didn't occur to me in, until the applicant uh, had talked about, you know, some of his plans, which is it, it sounded to me, I don't know if it was meant this way, but it sounded to me like dividing up houses. That's what it kind of sounded like in terms of creating a duplex. Um, and, you know, based on the comments of my fellow council members, I definitely think that there are areas where duplexes would be good. Um, that's why we have R3 zoning. But I also think that there's areas that it's not going to work. And it actually, frankly, scares me that you could get away with no minimums with a 37-foot wide lot. That's small. And so I, I, at the moment, I'm, I'm not convinced that the ordinance as it is is something that is good for Urbana. I don't think it meets the accessibility, the affordability. Um, I find it interesting that some of the pictures were actually down the street from me. Uh, there are many, many different kinds of housing available within three blocks of where I live. There's duplexes, rental houses, group houses, there's apartment buildings, there's like everything, and it's a half a mile to the University of Illinois. Um, rents range from $600 a month to on up, right, in, at least in my neighborhood. Um, a very long-winded way of saying that I think that when we change the zoning ordinance, it needs to be right for the city. And what I'm hearing from people is that it's right for certain areas. And so if it's right for certain areas, then we need to have an avenue to facilitate those types of areas, but not make an overarching change for the entire city. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm standing. I'm okay keeping this into city council. I'm sorry. I'm okay keeping this into committee right now. Um, but I just wanted to let people know where I'm, where my thoughts are right now. So I will take the chair back. I will yield the chair back to Mary Alice. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Grace. Yeah. One thing I'm going to add. Go for it, James. Okay. Uh, one thing I want to add, and I think I may have mentioned this last time, is um, we have a comprehensive plan. Uh, coming soon. And I, I really feel like if that plan is going to speak to this in any way, we should get a preview of how it would speak to it. Because this is a, this is a major change, no matter what anybody says, this is a major change. It has significant impact on a number of areas in the city. That should be done through, I feel, through the comprehensive plans guidance as opposed to a response to a single request to make this change. That doesn't mean it's not, uh, it won't turn out to be a viable change, but I think it should be informed by all the effort we have put into developing a new comprehensive plan. Thanks. All right, Grace. Thank you. Um, I just kind of in response to that first kind of time hearing that thought about um, certain areas having different kind of duplex things. And um, my initial reaction is that I think that it should apply to the whole city, the whole city and all of the zones. I mean, if it applies to R2, it should apply to R2 throughout the city. I think that having an exception for one neighborhood and particularly one uh, particularly vocal neighborhood is not the right approach. I think it should apply um, more broadly, which I think maybe you're saying then if it's not right for everyone, then don't apply it for everyone. Um, but I think that we should consider that whole issue together. And I'm still trying to understand the problem with this proposal, because just the way I'm seeing it is that if the Florida area ratio is still the same, the open space ratio is the same, you still can have a building higher than 35 feet, you still have to have at least 15 feet front yard, five foot side yard, 10 foot rear yard, and R2 still has a conditional use permit for public input at the ZBA for duplexes. I'm just not seeing the issue, um, so I'd like to if anyone is open to articulate that end, like I, I'm not seeing an issue with groundwater, with the city frontage, front yard thing. I'm not seeing what the problem is. So I think if, if there's a, that kind of logistical thing to lay out, I'm happy to hear it, but I'm not seeing what the problem is. Any other discussion? All right, so the motion on the floor. Um, oh, Charisse. Just, just, I just wanted to say one thing. I, I, I think when we're talking about, you know, um, changing zoning and so on and so forth, 
uh, and Grace was talking about she doesn't, you know, see the the what the problem might be, uh, and and I guess you know, um, I guess my concern is more like um, I think we want to be careful that we don't ghetto ghetto ties, so to speak, any one particular area uh, of the city. Uh, affordable housing is also is, is usually uh, in some people's minds synonymous with low income housing and that is not the same and um i just what i don't want to see is is a particular plan of um of 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 a type of housing that becomes uh something that that um people you know can you you can only afford this particular thing it it, it uh, based on your income and so we want to be careful to also make make that make affordable housing affordable housing and um sometimes what what happens with with uh, redefining certain types of homes is that um it can be and uh, it can be defined for certain income people so to speak and I don't I just don't want to see that happen I want people to be able to feel free to 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 live where they want to live and I say that based on previous history with the city of Urbana and how how things have been put in place before so I really would like to see. Um, I, I want to understand that you have folks that have worked all their lives to own homes, and yet some, if they when they sell it, what you're saying too is that somebody can take that home and turn it into two lots, two, two uh, on a lot or some kind of way, and it could be still profitable for one, but really not very helpful for the other. So I guess that's the problem I'm looking at as future in the future of of changing the zoning. All right. Jaya. Um so I think you know there's a lot of discussion to have around this. I think what I'm hearing from Grace that I I think is important to lift up is I want us to make factual decisions based on information, based on expertise, based on equity, based on best practices for small cities, which is what we are. We are a small city. Our population is increasing. There are not a lot of options for folks who are looking for that next step. And these areas are areas that are supposed to already allow duplexes from, from my understanding is, if I'm incorrect, I'm open to that information. I'd like to be corrected. Um, but having a duplex built, you know, if it was built next door to me, great, right? You know, great that Wuna already has that. Um, a lot of parts of the city, it's very difficult for folks to find places to live unless they're in a position to be able to afford to move out. Um, I don't think that's responsible for us as a city. It costs more to continue to push people out farther and farther. Um, and I I want to be careful about how we are describing. We're talking about making it more approachable to, to build duplexes. And I think especially in, in my part of the city where we do have a lot of duplexes or um, a lot of homes that are connected, I certainly don't see that as ghettoizing it. Um, I see our, I think, the fourth ward, um, you know, certainly the part of it that I live in is an incredibly diverse neighborhood, um, racially, economically, in terms of age. And what I worry about with my with my neighbors is that there are houses that are falling apart that people are still being asked to pay exorbitant amounts for rent, um, where there could be more opportunities if if folks were able to build something that would actually be more appropriate. Um, so I think if we're going to have rules, we need to be clear about them. I think what, what I see with this is trying to clarify contradictory pieces of the rules, hear what folks are saying in terms of the new comprehensive plan. I, I get that argument. 
But if we're going to say something is allowable, it should be allowable. If it's not allowable, it's not allowable. And if we need to look at zoning things differently in the future, I get that. Um, but I, I want to say that I think embracing the diversity of different forms of housing is a benefit to our community. Um, and feeding into fear of what it means to have two families living next door instead of one is, is highly problematic. All right, I think everybody except for Chandra's had a chance. Chandra, do you wanna speak? So um, I recently learned about um, a House bill um, in Congress called um, Yes in My Backyard. And it's um, it talks about land use policies and how um, it details a lot of the things that we're discussing here. And so if this is a conversation that's happening on the federal level, it most certainly should be happening on the local level. And it, it includes allowing duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes in areas zoned primarily for single family residential homes, allowing um, multifamily development and retail office and light manufacturing zones, allowing uh, reducing minimum lot sizes, um, increasing the allowable floor area ratio in multifamily housing areas. So if we're already talking about um, changing our zoning ordinance, we're a step ahead of the, the federal government. So I, I think that we're moving in the right direction and I would be in support of um, this, um, what do you call it, um, amendment to the, to the zoning ordinance because it, it, it just is the right way to, to go to, in, to increase our housing stock, as Jayan mentioned, to infill what we have now. All right, I think everybody's had an opportunity to talk. Um, so there's a motion on the floor. And just to remind everybody, this motion is to keep it in committee. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. All right, I think that stays. I don't, I don't know if everybody voted, but can I have a show of hands actually? Cause I didn't hear everybody's voice. So everybody who wants to keep it in committee, raise your hand. James and, and Charisse, I don't know, virtually wave your hand at us. So can yes. hear. Yeah. Thank you. All right, all those who um, wanna vote no, raise your hand. Okay, all right, that stays in committee. Um, all right, thank you very much for your time. We have one, two, three, four, five, six items on our agenda. It is 10.15, folks. We're gonna have to go through this. Can I have a motion to extend this meeting to 11? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Jay, second and by Grace. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay, all right, we're till 11, but we're gonna crank through these. All right, first item of new business, resolution number 2024-11074R, resolution authorizing acceptance of a DECO community development block, cur cur I can't say the word anymore, COVID, can I call it code? COVID grant, CDBG, <coughs> so Nick. Hello again, um, I'm gonna help with speeding things along and I'm actually gonna speak uh, to the next five items on the Wonderful. agenda. Um, that's again resolutions 2024-11074R uh, through the one that ends in 078R. Um, these items are all related to acceptance of three different grants through the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, each of which has an acceptance resolution and two of which have a resolution for subrecipient agreements. Um, so in total there are five resolutions for the three grants. And then each of the three grants um, has its own memo in the packet. I'll quickly run through what the different grants are, um, how much funding there is, um, and what for, and then I'll leave it up to council to decide whether to discuss and vote on the items separately or together. Um, so first, um, there is an award of $1,200,000 in Community Development Block Grant CARES Act or CDBG CV funding through the state DCEO. Um, this is the memo that starts on page 66 of the packet for reference. Um, these are funds that originated from a federal coronavirus relief package um, that was awarded to the state to manage for initiatives aimed at addressing homelessness and um, 
which again are now managed by the state DCEO. Earlier this year, um, the city applied for funds through this program to assist with the development of the Hope Village Permanent Supportive Housing Project, um, which would provide tiny homes for medically fragile individuals who have experienced homelessness. Um, a public comment period and hearing were held prior to the submission of that grant application earlier this year. And then in September, the city was notified that the application was one of 12 in the state approved for an award. Um, so this evening, you have two resolutions before you related to this particular grant. Um, one related to the city's acceptance <coughs> of those funds, um, and then one subrecipient agreement granting those funds to Hope Village Incorporated. Um, and then the next grant um, is uh, another set of funds through the DCEO. Um, this is $250,000. Um, the memo for this particular grant starts on page 80. Um, this has also been awarded for construction costs related to the Hope Village project, um, and this was through a line item appropriation from the State of Illinois General Revenue Fund, um, and would also be project-specific funding. Um, and similar to the last grant, you also have a resolution for um, both acceptance of those funds and a subrecipient agreement. <coughs> Um, and then on page 92 of the packet, there is a memo um, for another $250,000 grant um, from the State of Illinois General Revenue Fund. Um, this would be for a pilot fleet electrification project. Um, this one just has a resolution to accept those funds since those would be managed within the city. Um, a little more details on that. Um, it would pay for some facility upgrades to support electric vehicle charging at the public works facility for city fleet vehicles and would also pay for replacement of um, current gas vehicles within the public works fleet with electric vehicles once the former has outlived their useful lifespan. Um, so that's a general overview of what these grants are. Um, staff are recommending acceptance of all the awarded grant funds and approval of the related subrecipient agreements um, where present. Um, in the case of the Hope Village grants, we, we find um, acceptance of these funds um, consistent with council goals related to reducing homelessness, um, as well as generating affordable housing, um, as well as previous council actions in support of the Hope Village project. Um, and then in the case of the um, grant to public works for the fleet electrification project, we find this consistent with council goals related to quality of infrastructure, um, as well as uh, sustainability of infrastructure. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I believe some representatives from the Hope Village Project are here as well, if there are um, questions about that side of things. And then Tim Cowan from Public Works is here as well, who can perhaps provide some more details about the um, fleet electrification project. Thank you. All right, questions for staff. Grace, I have one about the fleet electrification. I think it was majority of it was for charging infrastructure. Um, sorry. And so I was wondering, would that be centralized, like at the Public Works building, or are we going to have multiple um, <laughs> charging places? Kind of what's that plan? Uh, so we had attempted previously to uh, do an RFP to look at <clears throat> more like public uh, charging station build out, and it was unsuccessful. Uh, they weren't awarded the grant. We shifted gears and said, uh, <clears throat> because of some of the federal dollars through CJA and things right now, and it's kind of it's it's slowly rolling out they're hitting the main corridors i-57 74 things like that with some of those programs now and then they're going to branch out that the highest and best use of our time for the time being would be focusing on ourselves as the city of electrifying our fleet so uh <clears throat> the intent of that money is actually to build out charging infrastructure for city fleet vehicles at public works and then pay the upgrade costs to go from a gas-powered vehicle to an ev in the replacement cycle for future uh, vehicles um, there but no it would it would not be building out infrastructure throughout the community it would be at the public works campus um, infrastructure charging for EVs for our fleet other questions for staff <coughs> so the 250 is for public works and then it is is it 1.24 for um, for hope total 
Um, so there was 1.2 for Hope right. Village. Um, that was through the CDBG CV fund. Right. Um, and then there was an additional um, quarter million that was just um, also through the DCEO, but through um, a state of Illinois general revenue line item appropriation. So about 1.4 mil. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I have a question. Yes, Sharice. My understanding is that um, the DCEO um, Community Development Block Grant is is pinpointed for the whole village period. There's no other um, uh, organization to be, be receiving the um, the CDBG. That's correct. Um, for these funds in particular, these were awarded in response to an application that the city submitted um, specifically in support of this project. Mm -hmm. Okay. James, do you have any questions? All right, so we have four items, five, five items no. on here. Oh, sorry, James, did you have any questions? No, I do not. I was just slow on the mute key. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to ask if we can put this in uh, either. We can either do one omnibus and then put it on the consent, or we can just move each individual one to consent. But those are, I don't know which direction council wants to go tonight. I uh, would move an uh, omnibus of, um, I would say maybe the first four, but I do all five, but unless anyone's going to want to divide those out, we could just save that and bundle I'd the like to one. have the, the uh, electrification divided out. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll do the first four. So I read them all and move to omnibus those? Okay. So I would move that we omnibus resolution number 2024-11-074R, resolution authorizing acceptance of DCO community development block for <coughs> coronavirus. Also, resolution number 2024-11-075R, resolution approving CDBG CV subrecipient grant agreement with Hope Village, Inc. Resolution number 2024-11-076R, resolution authorizing acceptance of DCEO grant, Hope Village, and resolution number 2024-11-077R, a resolution approving a subrecipient agreement, grant agreement with Hope Village, Inc. Second. All right, uh, on the floor is a motion to omnibus the first four items on here. It's moved by Grace and seconded by Chandra. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. No. All right, uh, that moves forward as omnibus. Now we need to move that on to city council. So I would take a, a motion to move that omnibus onto either consent or regular agenda. I'll move the omnibus uh, set of resolutions onto the city council for approval on the consent agenda. A we'll second. All right, seconded by, sorry, first by Chandra, seconded by Jaya. Any discussion? All, right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. No. All right. Uh, we have uh, item number five, so that one was not included in the omnibus, so I'll need a separate motion for that one. Move resolution number 2024-11-078R, resolution authorizing acceptance of DCOE grant Urbana Pilot Fleet Electrification Program to City Council Consent Agenda. Second. Second. All right, moved by Grace. I'm going to go ahead and give it to Sharice. Um, seconded by Sharice. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, that motion carries. Uh, thank you very much. Huh? Yeah, she said consent. All right, uh, the last item. Uh, in new business is ordinance number 2024-11036, an ordinance revising the annual budget ordinance. Budget amendment number two, omnibus. Elizabeth. I'm going to try to make this one easy, too, because you've discussed a number of these items already this evening. So I'll, I'll mention those real quickly and then um, talk, talk about a couple others. Um, so 
you have already discussed the you just discussed several of the grants in here. So in here we're showing the fleet electrification grant and the two grants they're getting passed through to Hope Village. Um, we're also showing, as Tim mentioned early, the 300, earlier, the $300,000 increase in the recycling fund uh, to continue the weekly recycling through use cycle. So other than that, um, in the general fund, we're requesting $56,100 for consulting services related to fire service in the campus area. And this is related to um, an agreement between both of the cities and the university. And there would be a reimbursement of 30, sorry, that's a really small number, 34,000 dollars coming from the other partners in that. Um, there are a couple of corrections to the budget for the community engagement team. These are just errors made in entries during the budget process. No change in the program, um, but a couple things just got in, in incorrect line items. Um, let's see, a couple of rebudgets in the capital replacement and improvement fund related to facility projects. Again, rebudget just means with something we thought would be under contract and committed before June 30th, that didn't happen. So we're just rolling it forward into the current fiscal year. We would um, reflect reduced revenue from the local motor fuel tax, $200,000 less just related to um, what we had anticipated in the budget versus um, what we know now is actually um, approved. And then um, some corrections and cleanups in the VRF. Some of those have to do with timing of purchases, similar to the items in the capital improvement fund. Some of them have to do with an error that occurred in reconciling items on the equipment list that we provided in the budget to the actual numbers in the line items. Um, other than that, I think that's everything that I have. Questions? No questions. Sharice uh, and James, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions right now. I mean, I, Me neither. All right, well, I would entertain a motion. I got a question. Oh, Grace. Um, Elizabeth, I was looking at the attachment and one of the last transfers from police patrol says transfer to VRF of that 45,000. Yeah. I just wanted to check that was right. I thought stuff was in the VRF that wasn't supposed to be. Cor correct. Um, I'm not sure exactly where you're looking, but what we're doing is, um, there was money that was budgeted as a transfer to VRF, so somebody mistakenly assumed that the equipment we were talking about was capital equipment. It wasn't. And so we're going to show that as an expense in the general fund versus a transfer into the VRF. So we don't, we only budget capital equipment in the VRF. Okay, but you're saying it's, it is correct that it should say description transfer to VRF fund this 45. Oh no, it's going out. That's the it's negative 45. It's coming out, right. Yeah, it's okay, a reduction. Okay, so other supplies. So transfer to VRF, but it's negative, meaning you're taking it from there, right? Correct, and we're putting it in a line item for supplies. Okay, thank you. All right, um, with no further questions, I would entertain a motion. I move approval of ordinance number 2024-11-036 and ordinance revising the annual budget ordinance, budget amendment number two, omnibus. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Chandra and seconded by Chris. Discussion? Yes, Grace. I would like to divide the question for the CET community engagement team budget transfers. Those four items I'd like to divide from the other. I, I, I'd like to suggest, pieces. I feel like there's a motion on the floor. I don't know if we can divide the question. We yep. can divide the question, but after that motion. No, you can divide the question before That's final what I action. Thought. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we so can, we can we divide can it now. It if, if it moves on to city council, you can divide it there. That's not what I was saying. 
Oops, I'm sorry. That's okay. I was saying we that now is an appropriate time to divide the question to consider the individual components. So am I correct, Grace, that you were only pulling out certain items uh, to be considered separate from the rest of them? So the rest of them would be considered with the main motion. Grace is dividing the question and pulling those items out. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So, Grace, which one are you pulling out? The community engagement? Yes, those four are transfers for community engagement team. Okay. All right, so um, do we need a we need a motion for the ones that are no they are they're all so on the we would need a motion to approve or deny the four com community engagement ones and Grace am I correct is that just one item or were you wanting to take the individual items that you're pulling one at a time yeah so just those four as C one. As, as one, one thing one versus group. the rest of them okay. Yeah. So we're, we've got two groups of things. One is all the things related to the community engagement, and one is everybody else. Is that correct? Okay. Um, so there it is. Doesn't the motion on the floor count as the motion? We're just splitting that into two? Yes. Yes, I think that's right. So the motion on the floor is to approve everything except for the community engagement item that you have just divided out for consideration. Okay. I don't know if everybody heard that. So right now, the motion on the floor is everything in the uh, omnibus uh, number two, except for the items that relate to the community engagement office. So that is what is up for discussion right now. Any discussion? And why are we separating stuff from the community, um, separating community, community engagement? Grace divided the question. Oh, OK. So I now we're understand. we're discussing everything but the community engagement. Okay. All right, Chris, will you you take the chair for me? I will take the chair and recognize Mary Alice. So I thought I'd give my re rationale for why I'm going to vote against this. Um, it's my only opportunity to vote against the single week versus every other week recycling. I fully expect this to pass, but this is where the money comes to pay those contracts. So that's my rationale for not voting for this. And now I will take the chair back. The uh, chair is yielded back to Mary Alice. Thank you. All right. With no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. No. All right. So um, the ayes have it. It moves on to city council since this is not final action and doesn't require a supermajority. Uh, the next question up is the community engagement officers. Um, discussion. Okay, no discussion. All what is the issue? What's the, what's the issue with um, regarding the budget for the the community engagement? Are we voting? Are we voting to move that forward, or what are we voting for? So that, that's a good question. So all the items in the omnibus number two for the budget amendment um, that relate to the community engagement officers is up to be sent to city council if everybody votes, the majority votes yay, nay. And then um, if it gets voted down, then it doesn't move forward to city council. So right now it's approval to city council. So if you vote okay. yes, then it goes it's, it's on to, to city approve, council. Approve this to go before city council. Yes. Okay. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? All those opposed. Okay. All right. That moves Perfect. forward on to city council. Yep. It was 5 2. All right. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I apologize, it's a late hour and we kind of lose our place. Um, last item up on the agenda is council input and communications. Does anybody wish to provide input? James, do you want to provide input during this meeting? Not at this time. Therese? Not at this time. All right, with no further business and Oh, Grace, yes. Is that recognizing? <laughs> or, yeah, okay. Um, just want to say about the 
the Hope Village grants and developments, I know that this has been an issue that um, doesn't have you know full agreement consensus like every almost every issue that we have here. Um, but just didn't want to gloss over some of that, that we have some kind of different perspectives here. And I know those all got omnibus and on the consent agenda, but just wanted to say that I'm, I'm willing and any council person has the right to pull that on the regular agenda. If we do want any discussion, people are still welcome to share their input. Um, and I welcome people to reach out. And if you'd like to have more of a conversation, I'm open. Thank you. All right, going once, going twice. There's no more business. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>